bowling performance. So how do you see cricket from a needs analysis perspective as both a technical coach and as a strength and conditioning coach? Well, I think the first thing, um, as the listeners who are players or coaches or P teachers or whatever, is that you need the understanding of all, all aspects of performance to truly have an impact. Uh, and that is James Smith's governing dynamics of coaching. So I'm not saying you need a PhD in everything, but ideally that'd be great. But <laughs> you need the understanding of S and C, of technical, tactic, tactical and mental awareness to have an impact because one ha might have a positive or a negative effect on the other. So, and then for me as a needs analysis for a fast bowler, it's having that knowledge, having that library of tools, a toolbox to identify the limiting factors in that one person in front of me. And then that would then, and then you need to understand the difference between style and technique technique is the attractors and the fixed skill or whether that's just a different style you know is it a malinga or, or sean tate or everyone has a different style but their technique you know is pretty stable across the board with the top level performance and then you design and what's the limiting factor uh is it is it physical is it tactical or is it technical or uh, again is it is it mental and then you come up with a plan but it always has to be based on profiling you, you assess don't guess you have to profile your fast bowlers to know what's needed otherwise you're just copying a program from somewhere else or a sport from somewhere else that you know because snc is in cricket performance training in cricket fast bowling is very young so a lot of it is very nfl very rugby based very power cleans very deadlift very clean clean grip grip deadlift and and all that stuff and actually fast bowling is 80 percent speed and only 20 percent strength in my opinion because the 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 load that you're trying to propel is only 156 grams so it doesn't matter, matter how much you can bench press that's not going to have an impact and why i can say that is because there's <laughs> i'm a strong man i'm not sure there's anyone going to be as strong as i was because, and I'm, and I'm not saying that flippantly, but, you know, when I used to do fitness tests, I used to warm up with other people's maxes because I thought that strength was really king and queen for fast bowling. So I went down that rabbit hole. You know, I, I could bench press 150 kilograms. When my, when my fitness test for Derby, my last, last year for Derby at the age of 39, I did three reps pull-ups with 70 kilograms hanging from my waist and that's why I can say these things because I've done it and the people who listen to me talk and would be my coaches or my players or played with and go yeah he was ridiculously strong but then that didn't help me it helped me initially but then after that it just built a barrier I, I increased the uh, um uh, you know, my dynamic strength index, the amount of strength I had, I wasn't able to use. But I didn't have the knowledge I have now, otherwise I would have trained differently. And it's interesting because there's a, a quote that you kind of alluded to in our previous podcast and an upcoming guest I've got in Vern Gambetta talks about strength training being seductive. And it's funny how as strength and conditioning coaches, and I've certainly fallen into this trap as well, where you're like, well, I've got the performance metrics that say that he's improving and you just blindly assume that that same dose or the you know, same ingredients in the training program will always produce the same uh, outcome. Do you have any, I mean, I know we love this question and be it to death as s &C coaches, but in your experience with fast bowlers, have you found any sort of um, trade-off points where once you start to get beyond a certain strength level that, there's really no point pushing that ceiling because a three M pull up at seventy kilos body weight that's yeah, that was, that's serious. Yeah, that was that was. Um, I do think the pulling the lats are really important for for fast bowling, mainly for Golgi tendon organ desensitizing to posterior chain. You need because that's eccentric posterior is eccentric loading when you're bowling, and that can be strong. But again, it is. But the, the issue is. Um, I'll come back to your question in a minute. Getting stronger 
it, it, it doesn't matter. It, it's not going to do you any harm. Let, let's start with that now. It, it's not going to do you any harm to be really strong. But what it does do, it takes time away from something that could have been getting you better. So, and I think more strength and conditioning programs these days are just masking over poor technique. They're just making the, the technique of fast bowling, the poor technique, more stable. That's what they're doing. Because technique underpins everything. If you've got leakage in the chain, it doesn't matter how, how strong you are in the squat. If you're not separating your hips and shoulders and due to over squatting and overloading the heel, you know, the heel rocker, then it means that I'm really heavy on back foot contact. And then that means I can't get extended force closure and swing red retraction on my front leg, which helps me brace the front leg, which is, you know, a key indicator. It's my specific, one of my specific descriptors. So it's understanding actually what, what we're trying to achieve and what, negative consequences so i don't have a benchmark to your question i don't have a benchmark where i go he's strong enough okay or she's strong enough we go we move on it's just the understanding of the requirements how they bowl how they bowl are they hip or knee dominant are they tendon fascia driven or are they muscle driven you know i was well i wasn't really i was actually hip dominant and very uh, type 1B neurotype, a very fascia tendon driven. But actually, I, I, I incorrectly assumed that more muscle for me would help me bowl quicker. But actually, if I look back at it, I bowled the quickest in 2000. Um, so I put on massive amounts of speed in two years. I put over 10 miles per hour in two years. And that is that's ridiculous. That is a massive amount of speed, which is not normal. That that's, doesn't happen. But it happened because I didn't, I, ne I hadn't done a lot of weight training before. So I got to 24 years of age and I did weight training. And that stimulus, you know, then made me bang, poof, push up. I pushed the ceiling, you know, I, I, and it gave me an immediate burst. But then I plateaued because I was strong enough. But due to the impact that it, that initial strength had, I wrongly assumed that more was better. But it's not. But then I went down the route of weighted ball bowling and uh, just SAQ stuff. You know, uh, I did lots of ladders. They get a lot of criticism, but it's a tool. It helps you it helps you warm up. I, I don't get that. <laughs> it's, it's funny. The S and C world on Twitter is a funny. It's a lot of whinging and complaining at the minute. Just just stay in your lane and do your job. Don't worry what anyone else is doing. I find it really bizarre. And then I did lots of sprinting, and that pushed me up as well. So it, it's it's putting the right dose stimulus in at key stages of a, a bowler's development. If we're going in these academies, putting everything in early doors or, or without worrying about technique, put in early in the academy structure, where do they go then when they can't add ball velocity? Where, where, where do we go now? Because we've done everything. So that, that is a really important understanding that bowlers, each individual bowler is different and we need the right dose at the right stage of the development. You know, a bowler I had here, Wade, I keep telling, I keep, keep coming up on the podcast. I hope he's all right with it. Um, he weighed 58 kilograms, man. He couldn't bench press 20 kilograms uh, and couldn't squat 50 kilograms. So clearly he needed a bit of strength, but a general strength um, for robustness, for structural integrity, just for... Um, just to become a better athlete, physical literacy, athletic development. And then, but he still bowled 80 miles per hour, which is a rapid at a schoolboy level. And I looked at him, I went, okay, this, uh, am I going down the wrong route here with my training? And this was four years ago, which led me down to this rabbit hole of hip and knee. 
And then because I was comparing him with some other bowler who did was proper athlete that was like squatting millions, I wasn't getting any quicker. Uh, but then I introduced some strength to him. He improved, did lots of isometric work, tendon stiffness, and he left bowling 85 miles per hour. As an 18, 19 year old boy, that is rapid. And on my speed gun, you know, on my speed gun, you know, Joffre, Varen, Sean Tate, Stuart Broad have all have been around that mark. So this kid was rapid. If I'd have gone down the route of cleaning him, squatting, bench pressing him, then I'd have probably have done him more harm than good. In, I've just jotted a couple of things down, uh, listening to you sort of there, uh, just to see if my interpretation is uh, how you intended it. Um, when you said about making a, too much strength training, the wrong stage of development might make a poor technique more stable. Uh, yeah. Is that under the, when you said about the um, lats and desensitizing the Golgi yeah. tendon organ, is, if I'm interpreting it correctly, they were almost strong enough to tolerate a poor technique, but otherwise might have broken down if they didn't have that strength yeah. background? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So that, that's what I mean, because the stresses that are involved in fast bowling, you know, nine times body weight on front foot, four or five on the back foot, that's ridiculous. And nothing we can do in the gym is ever going to uh, replicate that. So they need to be athletes. But if, you know, for a door, I'm looking at a door here now. And if, the tech, if that hinge on that door is always going wrong way, it doesn't matter what I do with that door. I can change that door, but that hinge will always break at that place. And that is that hinge is the technique. But what that door, we might just make that door a bit stronger around that hinge or whatever. It'll take longer for it to break down. But in, in, um, in a variable environment, like cricket, fast bowling, when fatigue, when pressure, when stress, that technique will break down. So that's why younger age, younger bowlers, technique, technique and speed, bowl a lighter ball, over speed, you know, and then as they get older, then you introduce some strength work to it. But technique, we can't confuse the system, no neural confusion. We're trying to teach a power clean while trying to tra train um, a heel contact uh, on front foot and ball of foot on back foot with rotation, uh, but a power clean, we're teaching a totally different intra and intermuscular coordination. And that's, you know, that's what, what I say. When you're trying to, trying to focus on a technique of fast bowling, nothing else should confuse it. General strength, you know, general strength, do athletic development. And then when the technique, that motor engram, that pattern, is happy, you're hitting the attractors, then you can introduce your fandango cleans if you want to, if that's what you want to do. I don't Olympic lift, but don't do it early. Don't put everything early doors and hope, hopefully something will stick. It's, it's interesting because and what I really like about your work is it really challenges uh, not just what, I, what some people might refer to as conventional wisdom, but it challenges a lot of things where, as we said on the P version of this podcast, one person said it, five people believed it, and then it keeps going like that. So the, the first thing you've said uh, in when I was um, preparing for the podcast this morning is about your opinion of the traditional model of strength and conditioning, whereby you would start more general, so it looks less like the sport. And then as you get nearer to competition, it looks more like the sport. But I absolutely loved your, your take on that, or your critique of that because I've never thought about it in this way. So if you know what post I'm referring to, if you could uh, yeah, I did. elaborate I did that. on that. Yeah, that was about two, I've got my phone here. It was about last week, wasn't it? Whereas, uh, yeah, I've got it here now. So is it that one? Can you see uh, that? No, it's not. It's um... that, that one is the same principle and that title on that one is don't just, don't just follow the norm, speed first. So I think, you know, Charlie Francis was big on this as well. Um, give me someone fast and I will make them stronger. It'd be easier to make them stronger. It'll be harder to turn someone strong faster. So speed should underpin strength. 
so that this the potentiation benefit of moving quicker on training speed will have a positive uh, effect on lifting weights and strength so that's why in a winter well what and i didn't I, I didn't think about it this way really but i don't know whose work it was i i read every day i try and read something different every day and then i put it out there so people can <laughs> just critique it or whatever so when we finish in the off season for cricket what do we do we um do general we do squats deadlift uh, cleans if you want go well, deadlift and then we move to again if you're doing cleans do a clean so at strength speed speed strength then we move to a bit of plyometric bit of overloaded sprints bit of bowling then we bowl at, at the at the end so what that that what this uh, model suggests is and then we can't obviously do strength and you lose strength in uh, in about 20 odd days to new. So we can't have strength when we're bowling because that is neural confusion. It's just the sequencing. It just confuses everything. And you're going to have soreness in some parts and, you know, body's a protective organism. So it's not going to go where the, where it's sore. You know, if you've got doms in your quads from that squat, you're not going to be using that front leg bracing it with all that force coming down. So why not do it the other way? Technique. So let's go technique at the end of the season. Sit down at the end of the year and go, what was the problem? Bang, bang. Actually, I can't brace my front leg. Until I brace my front leg, um, I'm never ever going to bowl quicker. Because ultimately, um, it is about the one KPI you should have is the speed gun. Everything I do has a speed gun. That is your one KPI, your true performance indicator, which, which identifies a lot of things with the neural efficiency and everything. So... I'm never going to push that number up until I prove my brace front leg. Okay, well, let's do that now. You've only just finished bowling actually a week ago, but let's overload it. Let's slow it down. Let's manipulate the time under tension. Let's create feel. Let's wear oxygen suit. You know, let's do some fatigue learning. Let's pre-fatigued. Let's pre-fatigue your VMO and your hamstrings and then hold that position in the skill stability. Okay, so you're going to do skill stability, stage one, static holds, bracing the front leg. But in that time as well, we're going to do a general side of it. We're going to move quicker. So we're going to have a static, this is the post you're on about, isn't it? We're going to have a static technical hold, low, low intensity, skill stability, stage one. But actually, I, I want to move quicker. So I'm going to do sprints. I'm going to do some extensive jumps i'm going to do some pogo jumps because that's going to improve me get off back foot contact but it's still a longer contact than what i did two weeks ago bowling so it's actually you're not overloading that it's different aspect of the force velocity curve so let's do that and then closer to the season let's get your squats and your deadlifts or whatever the heavy general stuff in because we've now swapped around your nothing we can do in the gym is ever going to replicate what we do in bowling. And I'm bowling now because I'm in preseason. I'm in twice a day with my team. I'm in twice a day with my whatever. So I'm speed. So what am I not doing there? I'm not doing general strength. Well, let's do it. And let's do it in the way that potentiates my bowling. So it's a totally <laughs> a different way of thinking. But I, I, I believe that is the right way you, you, you know i've never understood why why cricketers would stop bowling for four months and just get strong and then expect that to transfer to your fast bowling a month before season it's like come on if we think about these things logically that's not going to happen so that that's why it's you've got to keep bowling you know you wouldn't get a sprinter not running you wouldn't get a cyclist not cycling in off season so why are we stopping bowling? I get it's stressful. Well, let's design drills that make it less stress, less stressful. The skill stability model. Yeah, and in fact, just listening to what you say there, I'm reminded of, and this is the thing, when you work with professional sport, every now and then you'll have some someone come up who's an anomaly, I can never say the word, an anomaly, who... Yeah flies against what you've been told. Now, we had a, a couple of bowlers at a cricket club that I published my master's with. 
we have one guy who, again, similar to um, people you've mentioned, he was athletically the worst fast bowler they had. Like, terrible shoulder range of motion, probably the weakest guy, the least fit, and somehow was never on the physio table, bowled all year round. We had another guy, supreme athlete, consummate professional, was always looking for ways to improve his performance. I remember having detailed discussions with him on uh, Kelly Starr at Supple Leopard, and yeah. he was talking about maybe going into strength and conditioning after his career, and yet would always get injured. And you're like, but you're the fast guy. You're the ath athlete. You're the guy who, and I, at the time, I had several theories around why that is. But again, listening to what you're saying there, one guy who hated the gym, he's like, no, I, I just bought. And like, as an SNC coach, you're like, you must be wrong. But he wasn't. Yeah, there's two things there. And again, it's only a recent couple of years when I, I've sort of got this understanding. Firstly, it's about removing muscle slack. So that, that athlete, that athlete, that super athlete you're on about is probably awesome in the gym, but the barbell is taking the slack out for him. So putting the weight on his shoulders immediately removes the muscle slack. But that doesn't happen in fast bowling. You need to find a way of removing the slack and create the tension pre pre skill sort of completion so before force uh before you hit ground contact you need to move remove the slack and then you need to have the ability then to relax so the best bowlers in the world are the one that pretense and relax at the right time otherwise you know reciprocal inhibition if you're um if one side is uh tense the other side needs to be relaxed. But if you keep doing weight training, holding on to that tension, teaching the body to hold on to tension, to grind, the body's never going to know, know how to, firstly, remove muscle slack naturally, and secondly, to relax at the right point. That is, that is a big thing. Uh, and secondly, is that a Davis's law, it's a fascia, Sports is about fascia. It's about understanding the slings, the oblique slings, the fascia system. And it's, it's a case around the body. We're all fascia and it's all interlinked. So training one aspect of your action is going to have a positive or negative effect on another part. You know, if I, if I want to create tension here, bang, I need to create, create tension in the, in the left hip here for that oblique sling but I'm not going to create tension if I haven't got swing leg retraction because I'm too heavy on back foot contact. So it doesn't give me time to set up. And that's why it's all interlinked. But with the fascia, Davis's law, so you deposit, whenever you're doing anything stressful, a heavy bench, proper eccentric loading, or a heavy squat, it deposits collagen because it's life, fascia's life, deposits collagen. And the more you do of that same movement, you're going to develop stress lines. So and that, that gives you your technique. That develops the technique. So that kid who's just bowled, his stress line were his bowling. That's the only stress lines he's had. And the bowling, which is faster than anything we can do in the gym, um, the ground contact times are faster than anything we can do in the gym, the rotational speeds, the arm speed. So he's developed those stress lines specific to, funnily enough, what he's trying to do, fast bowling. But the other guy, stress lines was a squat, was a clean. And then now and again, he'll try and bowl and the body and the fascia system is going, what? What was this? Well, well, I know I come here now and again, but actually I'm not built for this. Uh, the stress lines are conflicting to what you're trying to ask me to do. Yeah, and that's why you get muscle tears and tendon strains, and it's 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 a different way of thinking at it. But it's about coming in from different perspectives, man. Yeah, and again, it makes me think back to our uh, PE podcast. Uh, one of my favorite quotes. I wish I could remember whose uh, whose quote it is, but it's like the sign of a genius is someone who can hold two conflicting thoughts in their head um and still you know deal with it so on one hand i'm thinking he's a fast bowler he should be fast bowling and it makes perfect sense why this fast bowler would be like no i'm going to stay away from the gym but then with my snc hat on i'm like oh yeah but we need to improve strength we need to improve robustness and it's not that again like the like with the p chat it's not about 
here's your gym training, here's your fast bowling training. It's like, right, we need enough of each at the right time. It's not that all we do is gym, all we do is fast bowling. It's, it's not one size fits all. So you might have someone who does live in the gym, who, 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 who will, that is his limiting factor. He or she has already got speed. They've got the arm speed above like 800 RPMs. They've got that. So there's no point in me trying to bowl more or, you know, their, their speed barrier, they've hit their speed barrier. So how, how you need to remove someone uh, from their skill if they've hit their speed barrier. So I would take this person and go, right, we're going to hit the gym for four weeks. The only bowling you're going to do is maybe a bit of kneeling constraints, weighted ball bowling, but we're going to improve the lifts. And then you've got someone then in the gym who can squat the world, press the world, and is actually not bowling faster. Where you go, okay, you're out of the gym. You're not, we're locking it. You're not coming anywhere near it. You're going to bowl. You're going to bowl with the, but you're going to do over speed, you know, over speed assisted work. Teaches the vestibular system that it's okay to go quicker. That, it, that it's, and the only way you can do that is over speed training. So pulling the bungee cord, pull them through. So you're getting them faster off back foot more force onto front foot contact. And, and the vestibular system has to adapt then and to go, oh, okay. Because at the minute, you're, you have limiters. The body is a protective organism. And you're not going to remove these limiters until you do the skill different than what you do in the game. And that's where people, and the gym work will not do that. The gym work will improve you as an athlete. And it's really important. Gym work is really important, and young athletes, young fast bowlers, you need to get in the gym, but don't make it the event. Don't make it that your sport. Okay, and that is the problem, and that's what I call the gym whiteboard syndrome, where just because you've improved, you're now bench, you're now squatting two times your body weight, bench pressing, bench bench pressing two times your body weight. Actually, does that transfer to fast bowling? And that's your ultimate. Uh, the ultimate question is, what I'm about to do now, does that transfer? What's the transfer of training? And that's why Bondichuk is, his system is, is outstanding for fast bowling because you can just break it down, break it down. You know, you've got that pyramid, general, specific prep, specific development, competitive exercise, which is your skill at the top. Well, actually, some, somebody, some younger training age might need to swap that upside down. Sorry, <laughs> um, might need to swap it upside down. So that would be a, a higher training age, which is more competitive exercise and less general. But then your younger training age would be loads of time at general. And then, but you'll always do bowl. Every session I do, you've always got to bowl. Whether that is a part. So uh, that's what Verkashansky stated, didn't he, with the... Uh, with special strength, specific special strength are both the same thing. You've either got to do the skill in part, or you've either or you do the skill as a whole, but in different conditions, either underloaded or overloaded. So every time you have to do the skill, otherwise you're not going to have transfer. And that smaller the transfer window, the more chance it has of going into the skill. And ultimately, speed gun. A speed gun, I see so many bowling coaches without a speed gun, whether that's pocket radar or a stalker. How do you know it's working? You know, and, 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 and they go, well, it's not all about fast bowling. Actually, cricket, here's one for you, I thought this this morning. Bowling is the only sport, really, as a, posi as a position specific that you can get away with not with no speed. You can get away with bowling. You can make a career out of 75 miles per hour. You can make it because it relies on accuracy and skill and tactical awareness. But in pitching, if you're a 80 miles, 70 miles per hour pitcher, you haven't got a career. But in fast, but in county cricket, fast bowling, you can have you can have a career, which makes it a unique beast to train for, really, because you know fits law that. When you try, when you're trying to do something flat out and accurate, it's not going to happen. 
you know, there's always a trade-off, and that fits law and states. There's always a trade-off between accuracy and velocity. That's why when you when you train velocity, you need to take direction out of it. You need to bowl flat out into a wall, not worry about um, direction. That's the only intent is is max velocity. But the, the speed, it's about building a speed reserve as well. But Stefan, I'm not developing under miles per hour. But let me let me t- ask you something, coach. Your bowler now bowls 75 miles per hour outswing, hitting the top of off all day. Awesome. What if he did that at 80 miles per hour? Then that's all I'm saying. That is better because then it's reaction time. And that's my message. Everyone can have a bigger speed reserve. So your 100%, uh, your 90% this year was 100% last year. So now you can focus on technique and tactics. And uh, just, it just uh, in scrambling between the copious notes I've got in front of me, um, something I've got written down is uh, how to avoid lazy or biased strength and conditioning assumptions. So just to elaborate that on a little, a little bit more. Um, when you talked about the squatting example, you mentioned about grinding strength, and you think of strength and conditioning coaches, you might say, right, I don't know, his back squat was 75, now he does 100, he is therefore stronger. And from my powerlifting background, I know when I go back into the gyms when they hopefully reopen, that yes, I'll have lost strength, but the main thing I'll have lost is the technique and skill of being able to grind out a lift. Um, so here I put the assumptions, for example, as an SSC coach are, well, 20 meter sprints are up, so he'll bowl faster, or plyometrics, he's got quicker ground contact time, so he'll bowl faster. Um, how would you avoid those lazy assumptions as a coach? And that, uh, yeah, they are they are lazy assumptions, but not through um, sort of conscious, not not on purpose. I yeah. think, and, and until because they're doing the jobs, you know, they're doing the jobs. Their their job is to uh, build them as athletes. So, and their key performance indicator is the whiteboard. That that is what the head coach or whatever will have a look at. So how, what, what's your um, program like? Is it working? Well, yeah, they yo yo last year. They were 19 and this year they've done 22 or whatever it is. I don't even know what they are now. So I've done my job. I've improved. So and st- until athletes, fast bowlers, um, programs are judged on match day performance, the SSC has no... Um, no requirement to change. And so uh, until for me, if I'm a head coach, I'm coming to you and going, you've spent 22 weeks with um, with John uh, and his numbers are awesome, but he's, uh, he's bowling the same speed as he did last year. So what have you been doing with him? Uh, and and that, is the, the, that is the discussion. And it might be, you know, they've hit their pace ceiling. That is it. Now, I've squeezed that sponge and there's nothing left of it. But actually, he's going to be a bit more robust. Um, we've taken him into sort of that uncomfortable zone with a squat, so he's a bit stronger mentally, but he is what it is. Now, you might need to do your job and talk tactics and stuff about it. But I, I, but if, if an SNC is not judged on, like, ball velocity or hitting speed as a, as a batter or those indicators then the snc has no need and that's not to say they shouldn't change because for me you have pride in your performance and ultimately it's not about us as coaches i want to see my guy bowling faster seeing the ball whiz past again wickets that's what i want to do i don't care what you know there's some kids some kids i've coached here who can't squat and will go to a county or an academy and will like well you're not doing a program very good program if you were at pace lab or wellington school you can't squat you're squatting 30 kilograms okay go to nets now boys off you go go to nets and bowling rockets and i'm going yep because that's my kpi mate <laughs> that's my kpi he's a bowler that's his job he's not a power lifter we're not a west side gym it's like really important we begin to um understand your role in a in an athlete's uh, future and Again, it's 
<laughs> one of those scenarios where you try and hold two conflicting thoughts in your head. Um, so something I've put down here is um, advice for strength and conditioning coaches who, for example, like you've got a background in cricket, your understanding of the sport is excellent, as well as obviously your strength and conditioning background. Uh, so I've put advice for strength and conditioning coaches who don't have your technical know-how, but who are also perhaps wary of the whole stay in your lane type of comments or you stick to the gym i'll stick to yeah. my fast bowling te te technique technique underpins everything it, it really does and I, I, that's a proper poacher turned gamekeeper comment from me because when i played i was anti-technique you know what are you messing around my te technique for i'm going to squat and bench and clean more but actually like I said earlier about the door hinge and the technique. So S and C's need a, a basic biomechanical understanding and a basic neuromuscular understanding as well, how the brain works. So motor learning, um, neurodynamics, uh, you know, all the DB hammer stuff, the autoregulatory stuff that I'm huge on at the minute with the drop off percentages. I'm doing a test at the minute with velocity bar training where I'm benching every day because I can't squat anymore. My joints are killing me. <laughs> but years of bowling, my Achilles tendon is, is... I've had a tendonitis in my Achilles tendon for 20 years, I think. And it went from left to right leg different years. So it was like I, I was in pain on my left leg. But then the next season, there was my right leg and my left leg had tolerated it. It was... <laughs> So my body is in, in bits now. So I can bench, I can do upper body stuff. And I'm doing a test. I'm allowing myself 2% drop off every day. And I'm trying to see if I can move the same, same weight on that bar faster every day. Um, and based on the neurodynamics and the DB Hammer system is the rule of one thirds. So I'm allowing, I'm going to fatigue myself a uh, third of the way. So uh, four days, because I'm having 6% drop off then it will take four days for me to get rebound back up to the my initial number and then another third, another four days to gain. I should have gained um, 6% on, on that lift, on the bar speed. And that is, so it's an engineering perspective on it, rule of thirds. A third, third of the time to apply fatigue, third of the time to, uh, to recover, and then third of the time to supercompensate. And I'm doing that now, so I'm training. But that understanding of the brain, neuro, um, you know, the vestibular system, the sensory motor system, the reflexive system, um, all that is really important. Because ultimately, it's, well, vestibular system was the first system developed, but it it's underpins everything. What we're doing as coaches and, and, the, and the strengthening is just a pimple on, pimple on the ass, if I'm honest. It's just a small part of it. There's so much more to it. Understanding the impact of the brain and the kinematics of everything. And then you can have your different theories, your dynamic systems theory and all that. And that's a matter of opinion. The attractors and fluctuators. But brain starts with the brain. And one of the, uh, that's probably my favorite analogy since I've been running this podcast, by the way. Um, one of my, uh, reading in one of your posts this morning, um, where you talk about uh, understanding your role as a bowler and saying, for example, that yes, there are some bowlers who you're going to work on the pinnacle, so their top end bowling speed. Yeah. Whereas going back to a point you made earlier, there's others where uh, you actually want to improve what you call their cruising speed. Yeah. Um, nice. Do you want to right. talk about how you train those two types of bowlers differently and what the approach would be there? Yeah, definitely. Good, man. Good knowledge. So the pinnacle would be the top end. So uh, um, that is about uh, bringing them in. So that's your that's your rear horse, race horse. That's your striker, the enforcer. That's your Sean Tate. Um, that's your Jofra Archer. When they, that, that's what I see his role as in, in the England team. And then you, you've got to improve their top end speed. So you allow them to bowl. And depending on where you want them to train again, you only allow them a certain drop off from that um, the, the, the max of the day. So that's why AREG is you, you, you don't deal in percentages generically. They come in the gym 
and their max of the day, how they feel there, where they're stressed outside or whatever, and then you work from that. So I allow him 2% drop off in ball velocity. And I did it, you know, I did it for the Royals. They could tell you I stood there with a speed gun. They might not have known that's what I was doing, but then for the following sessions, I would go, you know, try and bowl four slow balls in the next six balls. Because then, because there's positive with a catapult data, there's a correlation between effort, ball velocity, and the uh, uh, player load algorithm in there. And the player load is, is a combination of all the stresses, all the forces, and you don't want that to be high all the time. So by bowling slower, you can run in fast, you can run in as fast as you can, but you bowl it slower, the intent is slower, and that is it gives you a player load. So I say, do a slower ball this ball. So I know then you're managing their player load and their, their auto-regulate training subconsciously. But then if you're working with a bowler who is whose role is more of a holder, is more of a workhorse, uh, someone who can bowl a, a long spell, and they need to work in their prime capacity. So their ability to maintain their 80%. So their ability to, um, they might very well get to 83 miles per hour with a bit of bit of grunt, bit of effort, but losing losing your action and then risk goes. So your, te- your, your tactical, your technical uh, game is not great. So you're not going to be on for a long spell because you're bowling half all your half trackers. So then you want that person, and that takes them a lot to get to that 83. Well, okay, let's drop down to 80 miles per hour, but I want you to sit there all day. And that is a totally different training method. That's how you have a training session. And again, it's difficult to do as a group in a team environment, but it is possible. You know, there's no, there's always a way. You would tell this person to bowl, you only can bowl, like 80 miles per hour in the speed gun that's it or you have to get above 85 uh, and you just talk like that but the prime bowlers would then you'd work um you'd work the max of the day always try max of the day where's your nervous system today flat out what's your effort ball okay 80 miles per hour that's your effort ball now we're going to work back we're going to subtract about three percent from that top end speed because we have, we're going to bowl again in four days' time for every 1.5% drop-off in ball velocity requires one-day recovery. So we're going to bowl again in three or four days' time. So I'm only going to allow you to drop 2% from that initial 3% drop-off. And that it's complicated. It sounds en- engineering type, but it's, that's neurodynamics. And fast bowling deserves that respect. It sounds very similar to, I'm pretty sure it's Cal Dietz, but uh, I heard on a podcast, um, this is going back a few years now, uh, but with his throwers, and he would talk about measuring, I can't remember whether it was distance or speed, and he said if, for example, they come in and they do a few trials and it's just not there, he said, look, there's no point, let's go and do something aerobic. Um, yeah, do you have exactly. any, is that kind of the method yeah, that you definitely. follow, or do you just send them yeah. home? No, definitely. It's so again, um, whether you have so you might have one bowler come in for prime, you might have one bowler coming in for uh, pinnacle, but both wanting to improve velocity. So it's a, it's a rate dominant uh, bowling session. OK, but then if they come in and you've got the data and you've got the numbers, whether you've written them down or whether you remember them, I, I don't care. You've got, you know where they're at when they're at their peak. And then if they're a long way from that, they can't hit that. Then you know they've not recovered. You have know you've imparted that much fatigue in them. So, but you can bowl. We're, we're at the nets. So you've come to the nets. I'm not going to send you away. Let's do some tempo bowling. Let's do some, let's do, or do some skill stability work. Or let's do some super max grooving with a weighted ball. Or some kneeling constraints. Let's do something, but you're not going to try and bowl flat out because your nervous system has not recovered from the last one. But actually, my other bowler, my 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 prime guy, is fine. 
He's he's what he was last term. Then you go. You go as planned, but you're this other guy, you're gonna bowl, but it's gonna be tempo bowling. You're gonna bowl non-stop at 70% intensity for two minutes. So you're gonna bowl, you're gonna jog, get the ball, come back, jog to get the ball. So we're training the aerobic system, which is totally opposite. Fast bowling is the lactic aerobic. There's no anaerobic involved in fast bowling. And then um, we're going to go, we're going to improve the stiffness because of repetition, repetition on the ground. Um, you, can, you can manipulate the surfaces they're bowling on and they're grooving a pattern and they're also learning fatigue. Um, sorry, they're learning in a fatigue state, which is uh, great for fascia and tendon driven bowlers because the first thing that was your contractile elements. So we take that out of it, Franz Bosch big on this as well and then it becomes more about the fascia and the connective tissue and again just going back to cal d to get because somebody you've said there which i think a lot of coaches miss is uh well firstly when we talk about energy system and gpp uh i remember having a conversation with my powerlifting coach about what gpp would look like for me as a powerlifter and he said yes there's general physical preparation but like, there's also a danger of going so general that it's, it's pointless. So I love how you do tempo bowling with your guys. Again, Cal Dietz with his throwers, I think I've heard him mention that conditioning for his throwers, or these are big, big guys, I think they're uh, typically shot putters, is that he'll have them do 50% uh, 1RM bench, 30 seconds later, 50% 1RM back squat, rotate for eight minutes. There's no point sending these big guys for a run, just like there's probably no point getting a fast bowler on the elliptical for half an hour. Ah, that's a thing. And I know there's a big thing about cycling and um, there's a lot of uh, doing the ergos and a lot of bowlers go on that and treadmills and, uh, you know, like strength, power, speed, uh, bio bioenergetic training also needs to be specific. It, it needs to be specific to transfer. We, we have a great, and you wouldn't mind me saying because He's probably one of the finest fast bowlers uh, in this country. And Andrew Caddick, you know, he hated the gym. Um, and he he wouldn't go for sprints or training or jogging. And, and he would say, he would turn up to pre-season with a little belly on him. And it was a, like, it, it was an ongoing joke. But we know, and this is no exaggeration, by the end of pre-season, he would be like a racehorse. And bowling 90 miles per hour all day. I mean, all day. And I would have done body for life, Bill Phillips. I would have been on like 9% body fat, two minutes fast, one minute slow on the rower and treadmill. And I was fit, you know, I beat or I win all these fitness tests. But then I would look over and Caddick, and I'm going, he's just bowled an 18 over spell. And he's not been on any bike or a treadmill. And that, like, energy system work is also specific. And the old the old coach. And then you have the old coach, you got to bowl to get fit. Or you got the new coach, you got to be strong, you got to be a crossfitter. Actually, in the middle. Like, common sense would say, you've got to be in the middle. You can't just not do anything and bowl, because ultimately, that you're going to get injured there somehow because you haven't got the work capacity or the uh, the structural integrity to cope with that forces that are going to be imparted on the body. But also, you're not going to be better bowler by just benching and squatting more. It's in the middle. Yeah, and it, that's one of the reasons why I love doing these podcasts and one of the reasons I hate putting stuff out on social media, because that's probably going to be the answer for a lot of things. It is. And like I said at the start, I'm not saying my way is the right way. I'm just saying... It's a different way of looking at things. It's it's a it's an individualized energy engineering approach to coaching fast bowlers, and I've heard uh, a lot of people uh, saying it's just big words and it's complicated. And but actually, if you understand the fundamental principles of it, which doesn't take a lot of uh, you know reading, um, it's not that complicated at all. You don't flog a bowler in the net for two hours and expect them to bowl rapid in, in season. You just flog them. You've asked Usain Bolt to run a marathon. And that's all I do is give them a number on it. 
you're you I'm going to speed gun you. So too many coaches, I'm going to speed guns. I'm going to speed gun you. And as soon as you draw past that number, you're going to have one more shot at it. Otherwise, you're out. You're done. That could take 20 minutes or that could take two balls. But I know you're done. And that's not that's not complicated, is it? It's like, <laughs> No, and uh, if we just go back to the, one of the interesting things I was reading in your work this week about knee and hip dominant bowlers. Um, so just a couple of questions that I've got. Um, so you say that a, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, that knee dominant bowlers uh, can only use their strength when they're on the floor. So I'm guessing that they, the question relates to programming, whether you go more towards their strength than you use, for example, ballistic type work involving longer ground contact times or whether there's any is there any point in doing some more fast contact work or physiologically are they just not built for that well what i say is 70 30 split so um you embrace your dominance 70 percent of the time and then you need to strengthen the limiting factor uh strengthening in not in strength terms but you need to improve the limiting factor 30 percent of the time so in a 10-day cycle Seven days, if I'm a hip dominant bowler, fascia driven bowler, seven of the days, I'm bowling, sprinting, jumping, isometrics. Uh, I'm doing overcoming isometrics. I'm not doing any yielding isometrics. But then three days out of those 10, I'm going to do yielding isos. I'm going to do more force driven jumps. So it's a longer ground contact time. And I'm going to do some heavy strength work. But again, it's probably going to be clusters where I'm going to do cluster press, superset with a cluster one rep press, one rep squat, uh, and that way. So it's, again, it's specific to bowling. Clusters is really specific to bowling, especially the potentiating clusters. Um, or a knee dominant would do same day strength and three day speed. So you've just got to identify, and it's based on observations, the angle of back leg, like the, the, the angle of the flexion on the back knee. Are you trying to create more time by bending more at the back knee because you want to access the longer stretch shortening cycle or are you collapsing because you're unable to control the collision and you're not very eccentrically strong are you unable to pivot on back foot because you're isometrically weak you spend too long in the coupling time so what we need to do and it, what we need to improve is isolate them so you identify you isolate, you overload, uh, you constrain and repeat, you constrain, overload and repeat a key nodes of the bowling action, whether that's back foot or front foot. But it's all to do with how their, it's their pattern, it's their motor engram and whether that's come from your fast twitch or slow twitch dominant, you know, uh, uh, the slower twitch type 2A, I know that's fast twitch, but more slow twitch intermediate fibers 2A actually are more knee dominant. They want more time. That's what research shows in long jump. And most of my stuff is sprints and triple jump and javelin. I'm pitching now. Um, so there's a different sports all at once. And for one skill, I'm training. And uh, they need to bend more. Or are you a uh, type 1? neurotype uh, type 1b very high very sensitive and acetylcholine so your stretch reflex is very efficient which means your muscles uh, never get fully stimulated because it's all tendons it's all tendons so what's so do i need to spend three of those days actually training your muscle by you bowling on a soft surface by doing some force-driven higher ground contact time because we need to strengthen the whole lot. We need, for 30% of the time, you need some muscle as a hip dominant bowler. You need structural integrity. You need to support that uh, muscular tendon unit, you know, junction there. You need strength there and, and integrity and stability, robustness there. So you can't just, a hip dominant bowler shouldn't just be bowling and sprinting and jumping. They have to do some strength. And it's about getting everyone into that middle of that force velocity curve. Good at everything. And then that becomes about technique and skill level. We can't, we can't, it can't be about the physicality of a bowler. That's the limiting factor. Because that is, that's either inadequacies for us as s &C coaches or laziness for them as bowlers, really. That's an easy fix, isn't it? That physical is an easy fix having the right knowledge and the right tools. 
and bring them into the right position and then allow their skill levels to be the deciding factor between success and failure. But that is, I came up with that hip and knee about four years ago now when it's, I think it works. People, the old fashioned one might say it's not right, but it, I, I, I think it works. And you know, the, the fastest bowlers in the world have been the slingers. I've been the ones who have lowered their arms and are more sideways on. And then in the, the ideal style, not technique, they would seen as a bit, oh, that's a bit different. You know, if you watch Malinga bowl or Malinga bowl like he did because he wanted a bowl on a skiddy surface as the tide came out, he wanted and he found the lower in his arm helped it skid. So his environment constraint then meant that he, the more he bowled at that, the fascia, the Davis, the Davis's law and the, and the stress lines created that technique, that style, not technique, not style. But the fastest have been slingers because force is plane specific. So with rotation is one for you as a side on base rotation. So it's plain specific. We're telling bowlers to put their arms up higher. Well, that is that that rotational power has no impact then on this release up here. We need to lower the arm. But if you want to be an over the top bowler, straight up, then you need to be just turn your back foot round and make it less about rotation, more, more about linear momentum, less, less about angular, more about linear. So it's all joined up thinking. So if you're going to turn someone linear, hip dominant, then spend less time in the gym and squat is not going to improve it because I'm off my back foot in 0.12 seconds. You know, the fastest squat we're going to be able to do is like on a speed dynamic day is what? 1.1, 1.2 meters per second. That is, that's not helping you, my back foot. So it's just understanding that actually, but a partial squat might help me limit the more flexion on contact. That's what, what I need. So it's joined up thinking. And uh, just speaking about the, uh, just going back, you might have already answered this, but this is just sometimes thinking as you were going through. So I mentioned earlier about trying to avoid lazy or biased assumptions. I've definitely been guilty of this as an SNC coach where you see something and you think, oh, that's a physical limitation. Whereas you gave an example earlier where is it a case of a bowler who's unable to control the collision or are they purposefully spending longer on the floor yeah. to access a longer stretch shortening cycle? Again, you might have already mentioned this, but how do you determine whether, for example, they're deliberately doing it and it's part of their style, if that's the right word, or whether it's a physical limitation and we need to address that? Okay, so in simple terms, if they land and don't deform under stress, they're fine, they're, they're strong enough. That is a habit that their system is trying to utilize because more flexion at the knee requires more time, requires more internal rotation. So then they're gonna get a lot more torque. But if they land, it, it's the angle the back leg arrives pre-contact. If they're already bent and stay that angle, that's fine. Then they're strong enough. It doesn't, you don't need to re, they don't need to uh, overload squat anymore. They're strong enough. Uh, and if they land with a lack, with not a lot of flexion, uh, and they keep that angle, they're hip dominant, they're good. Keep going with it. But if they land, whether they're knee or hip, and sink again, that is a physical limiting factor. Then you then need to identify whether that's uh, eccentric uh, deficiencies or isometric. So what I say, if they land and sink, that's eccentric, unable to control the collision. Uh, but if they land... Um, and unable to pivot and a, a long time on back foot contact, then that's a lack of the isometric strength. So it's what they do. So it's what they do after collision. Well, what they, there's one for you. I've just thought of this. What, what they do pre collision will determine their dominance. And what they do after collision will determine their limitation. Absolute gold, absolute gold. And just going back to what you said about plane specific, I don't know whether you've ever, um, I'm sure you've come across Eric Cressy's stuff, but something that he, I think it was mentioned in one of the podcasts he was on, um, was that they found very limited correlations between sagittal plane power 
and the speed at which the guys could pitch at. Um, do you have any, I suppose, obviously you're blessed to have the equipment you've got, but do you have any thoughts as to, I suppose, a cheap alternative to assessing rotational power in your guys? Um, well, so I've got um, a ballistic ball. So we have a medicine ball that measures uh, meters per second. So that's one method. Uh, I've done some um, 1080 stuff with it as well. Um, but ultimately, and that's what more and more I'm, I'm finding out, is that some bowlers may run in quicker. Some bowlers might have uh, faster trunk rotation. Some bowlers might have arm speed. But the genuine fast bowlers, top performance, have a bit of all of them. And, and, that, and, and it becomes then about technique. You know, and it's funny when I do these podcasts, I, I also think about stuff as well. And, and that is where I'm at at the minute because it's about the sequencing of it and it's about the efficiency. It's about the ability to use that fascia system we have in the right sequence at the right time at the right speed. And that looks effortless and that looks Joffrey Archer. You know, that, that people, people say, and he is gold dust, absolute gold dust. Uh, I'd watch him bowl every day. It makes it look so easy. And you can go back to any sports, you know, you can go back to Ronaldo with football. You look at the stuff that he does. It's like, what? How can you do that? It makes it look so easy. And I'm going back to someone like a Jason Robinson in rugby. My, uh, he could just... He could sidestep, still moving flat out, but it was about the grace, the efficiency, the effortless movement. So it's not about having high numbers in one of them. It's about having decent numbers at all of them at the right time, I think, because I've had bowlers, rotation. Like I, I could throw a rotation, a, a ballistic ball, faster than anyone now. Anyone here? I, I could do it. Arm speed, it's okay, but then... My ground contact time, because I'm a heavy old lump, is, is a little slower now. So I know that is going to be a limiting factor, and I run in slower. But the bits of it, some bits are really good at. It's the combination of all of them, and it's that tornado, which I put the post on. It's that tornado going in the right direction in the right plane, because you get some tornadoes that have to be tilted, or and some tornadoes where it just lose energy everywhere and it's just a combination of everything and i think that's a perfect way of uh i suppose wrapping up how we probably both view strength and conditioning i think in textbooks it'll be like right you've got to do the general stuff and then you've got to do more specific and then slightly and it's like it's not like that it's as you said for example it could be that more speed is going to let me do better strength work or more yeah. technical work will allow me to do more you know general work or however you want to phrase yeah. it um, and just in wrapping up as I'm aware this is like your third podcast on the bounce um, <laughs> three questions to finish with um, the first one is one I love asking coaches if you could observe one person working with their athletes uh, who would you choose to observe and why uh, ooh, that's a tough one for me to I got a few actually so yeah, I'm going to yeah, I'm gonna, Christian Tibbadu how he gets athletes strong. You know, he, he got Pascal Coran, I think the bobsled athlete, ridiculously really strong by doing the Canadian ascending, descending complex. See, so yeah, I got, I know every training method going because I've tried them all. Uh, Franz Bosch, the way he looks at stuff, um, the intricacies of there and the dynamic complex system. Uh, Chris Corfist, uh, Stuart McMillan, you know, these guys, top top of the field, you know, and I'm good friends with Jonas Dodu. I'm going to spend some time with him. He's another one, but um, Bondichuk, obviously. Yeah. Derek Averly. Um, this is what I go, sorry, let me go back a bit. So I, I asked Derek Averly a question once about general strength. I wasn't sure where to put, where to put an exercise. I said, so where does this go then? Is this specific development, specific prep or general? Uh, and, I, and, I, and he came back to me and he said, well, by you asking that question, 
straight away tells me it's not that important for your program. And, and, and I thought, do you know what? Absolutely. I know where it sits now. <laughs> so those are the coaches. And uh, in terms of uh, one key resource to recommend to listeners, it could be a podcast, it could be an app, it might be a bit of training kit you use. Uh, what would be your one recommended resource? Oh, I, yeah, that's it. The tra uh, I'm going to give loads again, sorry. No, uh, go for it. The Track and Field Consortium, that's a great resource. Um, Altis Foundation, the Altis Need for Speed course, which I was involved in. Anything with Chris Corfist, the Simply Faster website. Anything with Christian Thibodeau's uh, writing is outstanding. You know, Triphasic, Carl Dietz, Matt Van Dyke. Edge U is an awesome resource um, with uh, Max Schmazo and uh, Paul, I uh, forget his surname. Uh, those are excellent resources. Unbelievable. And uh, finally, if you had one key take home for the listeners, so athletes, coaches, maybe cricket coaches or players, what would that be? Do what works for you. Like that, that is really important. Don't follow the, don't, don't be a sheep and follow the norm, you know, actually stick your head up the parapet now and again and go, is that right for me? And be, be respectful about it. Don't openly criticize your coach just understand, is that right? Why is it right? And how am I going to improve it? Just have the knowledge to um, have the ability to ask these questions. Yeah, and don't take uh, don't take something for gospel just because no. uh, I don't know if there's a name for the specific type of bias, but when you hear, I mean, I guess guru bias, if that's even a thing, but when you hear something from someone that you perceive to be cleverer or more experienced than you it's very easy to think well so and so said it so it must be right yeah and, and like I, I go back to what i said earlier like each system each coach education has come from one person has come from the opinion of one person and what's to say that one person was right and that's all i'll say perfect that's a great place to leave it Stefan. Uh, thank you very much for your time pleasure man enjoyed